And we now move on to minister, the Minister for, of Finance and Personnel. And I call uh, Michaela Boyle. Question one. Mr. Deputy Speaker, credit unions already benefit from special corporation tax rules, which mean that where a credit union makes a loan to its members, the related income is not subject to the tax. Those rules would not be altered by the Corporation Tax Northern Ireland Bill. More generally, and in order to manage the potential for artificial profit shifting, certain tradable activities, including those related to lending, leasing, and certain types of insurance, are to be excluded from the Northern Ireland Corporation Tax Rate. Nevertheless, mutual building societies and other firms that may be affected by those exclusions can elect to have back office activities included within a new Northern Ireland regime. Furthermore, all organisations that service a local marketplace stand to benefit from the significantly increased activity a lower corporation tax will bring. I have plans to engage with representatives of local credit unions and the Progressive Building Society to discuss how a lower corporation tax can deliver benefits for them, for their members and for Northern Ireland more generally. I call Michaela Boyne. Gormaga, can I thank the Minister for his response? Minister, I'm sure you will agree we must secure um, a good, fair deal on corporation tax, uh, one which delivers for SME businesses and uh, enterprises and works for all of our people. But, Minister, from your perspective, uh, can you further give me more detail on how we can ensure that this can be achieved? Gormaga? The, the members question, Mr Deputy Speaker, appears to be about SMEs more broadly and not specifically on uh, credit unions and, and, and mutuals. Uh, and on credit unions and mutuals, I'm aware of um, the issues that have been raised and I, I plan to engage, in fact, actually engaging with uh, the Progressive Building Society, our, our only building society based in Northern Ireland, doing so in the next 24 hours. Uh, and I plan to engage in some way or another with, uh, um, with credit unions in the, the next number of weeks as well. Um, obviously, a lot of SMEs in Northern Ireland wouldn't benefit themselves from a reduction directly from a reduction in, in corporation tax um, because of the way that they would be structured. Um, but the hope, I suppose, is that, and the expectation uh, based on the evidence that is there, is that the creation of, of 37,500 net new jobs over the next 10 years, uh, a growth in our economy of around 10%. Will assist all businesses in Northern Ireland, whether they are small, medium sized, or large enterprises, whether they are indigenous firms or whether they are firms who invest in Northern Ireland or are already invested in Northern Ireland or, or who invest because of a lower rate and corporation tax. And it is that growth in the economy with more jobs, more high paying jobs, um, that we hope will benefit all businesses in Northern Ireland. And some of those larger firms that are already here, uh, some of those indigenous firms who will see the release of additional capital into their uh, accounts as a result of a lower rate of corporation tax will take a decision to invest and to create more jobs. And it is that sort of virtuous circle, uh, Deputy Speaker, that we hope to achieve by lowering the rate of corporation tax. Nicole Sammy Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Does the Minister agree with me that the last question illustrates the Alice in Wonderland world that Sinn Féin are living in at present? Either the member doesn't know that her party has reneged on, the, good, uh, on the, the Stormont House Agreement, so no corporation tax will be devolved to this Assembly as a result of... I take it that is the question. I take it that is the question. Would, would he outline to the members opposite just what the consequences are of their disgraceful and dishonest behaviour order, this morning? Order, order. The member has asked the question. Minister. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the member for his question, and, there, and he's right. There was an air of unreality coming from the opposite benches in, the, uh, in asking a question about the benefit of uh, devolving and lowering corporation tax in Northern Ireland for small and medium-sized enterprises here in Northern Ireland. Because as a member, and indeed the whole House, and more importantly, those outside of this House will appreciate that, given the actions of Sinn Féin, the welshing on the agreement that there was made at both at Stormont House and in Stormont Castle. Uh, the devolution of corporation tax, which was dependent upon getting a budget agreed, which we did, which was dependent upon getting welfare reform legislation through this House, which was proceeding. Um, corporation tax was contingent on both of those things happening. Uh, that is clearly not happening now in terms of the welfare reform element. Uh, my party, the Members' Party, our party has kept its side of the deal. We will stand by every, every word. We will stand by every number in the Stormont House Agreement and in the Stormont Castle Agreement. 
because of the many benefits that that agreement brought for Northern Ireland, not least the fact that it was securing the rate of corporation tax and our ability to lower that. And the member will know from his membership of another place that that bill has been proceeding through that House at pace. It was likely to become onto the statute books in the next number of weeks. And that campaign that we've been waging for I don't know how many years um, was about to become successful. And it seems that moments away from, days away from grasping what some people thought was the impossible, Sinn Féin, who I thought supported the devolution of corporation tax, who I thought supported wanting to lower the rate of corporation tax to bring those 37,500 new jobs in Northern Ireland, to increase our economy by an estimated 10 per cent, are now going to back away from that opportunity and we're going to lose the opportunity of a lifetime to change the Northern Ireland economy for the better. It is up to them to explain not only why they have welched on an agreement around welfare reform, Deputy Speaker, but it is up to them as well why they have walked away from corporation tax, which is the inevitable result of what they have done today. I call John Dallet. I'm more than keen to return to the, the question of corporation tax and, and how it could be used to affect credit unions. Uh, the Assembly has a good, I think, a good relationship with credit unions. Uh, can the Minister perhaps tell us, or at least undertake, to look at how those millions of pounds that are invested by credit unions and banks could, in fact, be lent to people in the wider world who are depending on payday loans, loan sharks, money lenders, and others who rip them off? I am not surprised the member um, does not want to talk about corporation tax because his party is no better than Sinn Féin in, in that regard at this minute in time. I have no sense of shame from me or anybody on this side of this House today, having stuck to our word and, and stuck by what we have agreed. Uh, I don't think. Certainly, Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm more than happy to say that my party has stuck to every word that it agreed to, every number that it agreed to in the Stormont House Agreement. I mean, to, to be fair, it took, it took Sinn Féin several weeks to back away. You were several hours of your party before you backed away from, from what was agreed uh, at Stormont House. But, however, I, I am content and prepared to uh, work with credit unions and building societies and, indeed, anybody else to deal with the issues that the member raises, and, and perhaps it is um, as a result of the discussions that we will now, now inevitably have with credit unions as a result of this particular issue, it may, be, it may present an opportunity, an unwitting opportunity perhaps, to, to discuss those other opportunities that, that, are, that are there for that movement. In fact, the, the Minister for Social Development uh, and I have uh, discussed in recent times how we might do things to help assist the credit union movement to move to another level. Uh, I'm sure he may, he may well wish to, to continue to discuss that with me at this minute if he, if he isn't distracted by other matters. I call Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And can I return to, to the main subject? Uh, declaring interest as a member of Slimish and the Braid Credit Unions. The FSA undertook a review of the powers and the abilities of credit unions and GB within the last two to three years. Does the Minister see any opportunity of the powers that were devolved to credit unions and the rest of the UK actually coming to Northern Ireland credit unions? This is not, Mr Deputy Speaker. The uh, responsibility for credit unions, I think, rests with the Department of Enterprise, uh, Trade and Investment. Um, I do recall having been a member of that committee at the time, particularly around the, the, the period whenever a lot of financial institutions were having difficulties and there was an attempt to get the cover of um, and re um, the protection scheme that was there for, for savings, uh, that that required regulation to be done by what was then the, the FSA. Um, and one of the other objectives, of course, at that time was to be able to expand what credit unions in, in Northern Ireland are able to do and the products that they are able to offer, because compared to their counterparts in, in mainland Britain, they're not able to or haven't been traditionally able to offer current accounts or mortgages and, and, and those sorts of financial products. I think there is a view that it would be beneficial, even if some credit unions didn't want to offer that, but it would be at least beneficial if the option was there for them. Uh, and I would certainly support that expansion of, of the role, because one of the other more favourable contrasts with uh, credit unions across the water is that uh, around 25 of the member has declared his interest, I'm sure he's not the only member of the House who's a member of a credit union, around I think 20 to 25 per cent of people in Northern Ireland are members of credit unions, yet across the water it's, I think it's around 4 per cent. So the opportunity in offering those range of products, uh, additional financial products, is much greater in Northern Ireland and could actually address some of the issues that Mr Dallet raised in respect of people having um, borrowing from money lenders and having uh, low levels of financial capability in Northern Ireland. Moving on, I call Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Question number two to the Minister, please. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, the Northern Ireland Law Commission was asked to review the law on defamation and, on 27 November 2014, it issued a consultation paper which invited views on a range of issues. The consultation ran on, on until 20 February of this year. The Commission is due to close on 31 March 2015, and although it is hoping to produce an analysis of the responses by that date, it will not have produced its fin final report, which will contain any recommendation for legislative reform. It may be possible to retain the services of the lawyer who is leading the review project for a further short period to allow for the completion of the final report. My officials are currently exploring the options with the Commission and officials from the Department of Justice. I, call Anna I thank the Minister uh, for his response. Given the fact that the law in England and Wales has helped to ensure free speech and deter reckless uh, reckless defamation claims. What specific clauses does the Minister object to being implemented here? Mr. Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm concerned that the, um, the member is seeking to cur curtail my right to the free speech by suggesting that uh, there are elements of uh, the proposed um, defamation reforms, or what is now the law in, in uh, England and Wales and elsewhere. Um, that I am objecting to any element of it. The, the reason I asked the Law Commission to step in and, and do their work, and obviously at that time there was no threat to the existence of the, the Law Commission, and her, her party colleague, the Minister of Justice, has signalled his intention for uh, the Law Commission, Mr. Deputy Speaker, to be done away with uh, at the end of this year. And I understand the reasons why he is doing that. But my reason for referring the issue to um, the Law Commission was that there was um, a very strong arguments on both sides of the argument whether we should adopt what has happened in England and Wales, whether we should retain the current position in Northern Ireland, or whether we should go for some sort of middle way. And, and, and Mr Nesbitt, who was in the House, uh, was bringing forward a, a piece of legislation in respect of this issue. But and whilst he was in favour of adopting uh, the England and Wales position, there were others who were stridently against moving in that direction. I thought it was important to get an independent voice, an independent perspective from the Law Commission, um, which is what has been done in terms of the and a consultation has been carried out. I now want to, to complete that work in terms of bringing forward a final report, which may or may not contain recommendations for legislation, which I would then consider in the, the normal course of matters. I call Peter Weir. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his responses so far. Um, I wonder if the Minister could comment on the uh, response to the consultation by the Law Commission in terms of the number of um, people or groups that responded to it and what were the range of those groups? Um, Sir, Deputy Speaker, there has, um, my understanding is there have been 32 responses to the consultation. And I think there were, there were um, last update I received, there were two pending, so whether they have come in or not, I, I don't know. Um, 32 is not um, what I would consider to be a large volume of responses, and as they are, uh, as you might expect, coming more from, from those who would have a particular interest from the, the legal community, um, and uh, perhaps those from the field of media and journalism, it hasn't uh, exactly set the heather on fire in terms of public discourse in Northern Ireland. I think that, that reflects um, the fact that I think many of us in this House would be able to say that not a single constituent has raised this issue with me. Um, it is not an issue that seems to be widely uh, uh, the top of people's agenda in any way, shape or form. Um, but that doesn't mean that it's not an issue uh, that we shouldn't be taking an interest in, and that's why I asked the Law Commission Deputy Speaker to, to do the work that it, that it did, and, and I look forward to, at the end of uh, the work, however we get that completed, whether we get that completed before the end of this uh, year, which I suspect we won't, or whether we have to extend the lead lawyer's uh, work by, by a number of weeks. Um, keen to see what recommendations come back for, for reform because whilst well, 32 responses isn't a particular lot and large volume of responses, um, there is obviously a more important piece of work is any recommendations that come forward that would suggest where we in Northern Ireland might change the law in respect of defamation. I call Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you very much. May I preface my remarks by just assuring the Minister I am not wedded to cutting and pasting the Westminster legislation, but I am wedded to the idea that we should reform uh, our libel laws. The Minister makes clear that corporation tax could yield 37,500 new jobs. Has he any idea how many jobs will be lost if we stick with our current defamation regime across sectors including new creative media, academia, and of course the media itself? Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, I mean, these were the sorts of, and the member has taken a, a position 
very clear position. And one might expect the position that he's taken, given his, uh, his background and his profession in, in, in journalism. Um, but nonetheless, there are a range of arguments that he has put forward, just as there are a range of arguments that others have put forward from a contrary position that I was keen to explore, rather than proceed with just slavishly adopting what happened in England and Wales. And I think that's, that's the essence of devolution. I think it is up to us to examine, um, and from the particular perspective of Northern Ireland, is what we want. Uh, in respect of estimates of job losses, whether that's something that would happen, and I'm not entirely sure that would be the case. But that's exactly the sort of issue, exactly the sort of issue that I want to see teased out and wanted to see teased out through the work of the Law Commission. It is, I suppose, in some ways unfortunate that the Law Commission itself is going out of existence in a number of weeks' time because it has certainly disrupted the work uh, that it has been doing on our behalf, Deputy Speaker, in respect of, of defamation. Um, but I am keen that in the limited time available, available to us in this mandate that we continue to move forward with this work and consider, um, if any, changes to our law we should implement here in, in Stormont. Moving on, I call Jim Allister. Mr Deputy Speaker, there is no single business case for the public sector voluntary exit scheme. Each public sector organisation will prepare individual business cases to support bids to the public sector restructuring fund. The Northern Ireland Civil Service business case for the voluntary exit scheme covers the Northern Ireland Civil Service only. This business case was developed over a period of months before being approved by the project board and senior officials in January 2015. The executive agreed the preferred option at its meeting on the 5th of February 2015. Thank you. The, the exit scheme was part of what hitherto was optimistically called the Stormont House Agreement. Now that the central plank of that agreement has been demolished by Sinn Féin over welfare reform, um, does this part of the agreement still stand? Will the exit scheme proceed? Indeed, in light of what he said about corporation tax, is he confirming to this House he does not now expect that legislation to proceed? And what's the impact of all of this further on trustworthiness of Sinn Féin as a partner? What's the impact of all of that on his budget? Sir, Deputy Speaker, the member raises a, a, a good point in respect of the financial consequences of not proceeding with welfare reform. Uh, and those, uh, Deputy Speaker, in this House or elsewhere who think that not moving forward with welfare reform impacts only on welfare reform are kidding themselves. I've already described the impact that it will inevitably have on corporation tax. Um, it could well, and this is something that I will have to consider, not least in, in, in tandem with conversations with Treasury counterparts over the next number of days, the impact that it has on available funding, which was agreed through the Stormont House Agreement for a voluntary exit scheme. And let's not forget, Mother, and I mean, there's been reasonable discussion and debate in this House um, to myself and the member and indeed other members of this House about whether we should have been borrowing that amount of money. But I don't think even in all of those discussions anybody believed in this House that we shouldn't be proceeding with a voluntary exit scheme of some kind, some nature, in some way or another to relieve pressure on budgets in, in future years. So I'm going to have to clarify with Treasury very urgently the financial consequences of not proceeding for welfare reform on that element of the Stormont House Agreement, as indeed I am going to have to clarify other aspects of the implications on our budget of not moving forward with the Stormont House Agreement, because members will recall, Deputy Speaker, that large elements of, of what we are moving forward, what is a difficult year in 15-16, was predicated on a degree of flexibilities, not least flexibilities around a voluntary exit scheme. And that, Mr Deputy Speaker, is every bit as urgent to me as any other element of not moving forward with the Stormont House Agreement. Call Paul Gervin. Thank you, Minister, for his answers thus far. Uh, can the Minister give an indication of the range of other measures that are being taken uh, to reduce the public sector pay bill? Uh, and I think, in light of today's announcement, it's all the more important. There, there has been a lot of um, misinformation, either deliberately or otherwise, put out about um, the voluntary exit scheme, that the voluntary exit scheme would, would one of them, for example, is that there would be 20,000 jobs lost, that the 20,000 figure that was agreed at, at Stormont Castle uh, as a target by the executive parties was getting rid of 20,000 individuals from their jobs. And that, was, that wasn't the objective. It was about getting that rid of that many posts from the public sector, the broad public sector. Um, and we have been able to do that 
in already, and we've been already acting in that in a range of different ways and a lot of different strategic personnel interventions that will reduce our pay bill because the whilst a voluntary exit scheme will certainly reduce the size of our public sector and, and, and help to rebalance our economy. Um, the overriding objective was a permanent pay bill reduction. And you can see how that would obviously happen through a voluntary exit scheme. But there are other strategic personnel interventions, Deputy Speaker, which we have been uh, conducting uh, and acting already, including a, a freeze on new recruits. And that has already reduced um, headcount in, in the public sector by around 1,000 by just get, suppressing those vacancies. Um, we've also been suppressing what are called funded vacancies, which are already there within the system. There have been an embargo on substantive promotion, uh, and I was, um, I'm still committed to bringing forward to the executive a paper on further pay restraint in, in future years. And all of those, all of those issues, plus the voluntary exit scheme, will help to, we hope, achieve the 20,000 target. But more importantly, Deputy Speaker, will suppress uh, and lower on a permanent basis the pay bill, which, given the very difficult financial circumstances that Northern Ireland faces, not just next year but for several years into the future, is the overriding and most important factor. I call Danny Kinnan. The Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers so far. But should the voluntary exit scheme go ahead, the original scheme was announced as being open to all grades except permanent secretaries. Why then was the scheme skewed towards the lower ranks by an enhancement offer? Was that to make sure we didn't lose all the experience and skills? I mean, there, there are a range of factors around skills and experience which um, will have to be dealt with, um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, in, in terms of because it is a completely open scheme, with the, with the exceptions that um, the member has noted for, for, for permanent secretaries. Um, and that, even those will be dealt with because there are a few acting permanent secretaries at the minute and the reorganisation of government departments um, would obviously deal with, with that um, situation. Um, we do have to deal with, um, and officials from my department have, have been on the public record in respect of this around, where people will exit the public sector, um, and principally at this minute time the, the, the civil service, because that's the, the main scheme that's out there at this minute in time, that it could leave um, issues in terms of skills and experience in certain parts, and we will have to redeploy people from elsewhere in the system to those areas so that there can be continuity of business, and that, that is an incredibly important issue, Deputy Speaker, and all of this, that we continue to provide services at the standard level uh, that people expect, and that'll be, that'll be difficult, and that'll be incredibly challenging, and there will be some uh, change for, for people that uh, perhaps they would rather not undertake, but it's unfortunately the circumstances that we are in. The, in respect of, and I'll, I'll, I'll correct this to the member in writing if I get this in any, in any way wrong, but the uh, enhancement for those in, in lower pay as a result of a, a superannuation act that was taken through this House by, by my predecessor some years ago, um, which ensured that those who were lowest paid had some degree of, of protection if in the sort of situation that we're now in, where there is a voluntary exit scheme or indeed a voluntary redundancy scheme. I call Claire Sugden. Good Deputy Speaker. Um, the Environment Minister announced in June last year, in conjunction with the Finance Minister, to run a geographical voluntary exit scheme to generate vacancies for those who lost their job in DVA Corian. Could the Minister give me an indication of how many jobs from the scheme will go to Corian? I'm not sure. I think the, the member has conflated two issues there, but I'm happy to, to, to come back to her. I think elements of, of um, what she is, is talking about are probably in terms of jobs that have moved. I know the Environment Minister moved some jobs, a small number of jobs from Belfast and other parts of driver vehicle licensing to the Cold Rain area. I think it was a very small number moved from, from Belfast for that. Um, in terms of the voluntary exit scheme, it's not target. This voluntary exit scheme is for the whole of the civil service across Northern Ireland, wherever they are based. It is open to civil servants, whether they're based in Belfast or Coleraine or wherever it might be. Um, and in that sense, there is no specific targeting of numbers for the Coleraine area, just as there's not a targeting of numbers for the Belfast area, because, the, as I said before, the principle is to reduce the pay bill permanently. Uh, and in that respect, it is not a, a, a targeted scheme on a particular number of grades or a particular location or a particular section of the civil service. But um, I'm happy to follow up with the, the member any particular, the, the fallout or the, the outflow of, of what happened in respect of the particular DOE run scheme um, that took place last year to respond to obviously the, the move and the shift of jobs from, from Coleraine to, um, or shift of work rather, rather than jobs from Coleraine to Swansea. Moving on, I call William Irwin. 
Mr. Deputy Speaker, my department has submitted an initial list of infrastructure projects that has been included in the EU investment pipeline, along with projects from the rest of the UK and other member states. Whilst not all of the projects included in the pipeline will be suitable for financing under the EU investment plan, work is ongoing to identify those projects that are best placed to benefit from financing available. I have also invited EU Vice President Jyrki Katainen to Northern Ireland with the intention of promoting the investment plan. I want to ensure that the local business community are well placed to benefit from the financing opportunities arising from the investment plan for Europe, and I believe that an information event involving the EU Vice President would greatly assist in this. For a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. What are the implications for the planned Northern Ireland Investment Fund? Sir, let me speak. I, I don't think, in, in terms of implications, there may be positive implications. I don't think there are any negative implications. I actually think there is a potential for hugely positive implications for the creation of a Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Uh, and whenever I look at the timeline of the, the EU's investment plan and our own Northern Ireland Investment Fund, the, uh, it looks like our, our decision in the budget to create an investment fund for Northern Ireland and to stimulate that with some of our own capital and to draw down finance from the European Investment Bank might actually work in our favour. Because, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, the European Investment Bank are heavily involved uh, as the EU's own bank in financing the EU investment plan. So the fact that they are involved in the EU-wide fund, the fact that they are involved in our investment fund, may mean that there are ample opportunities for us to, to work together to improve the investment fund. We are already working with the EIB to try to draw down substantial millions into our investment fund, but the fact that this EU-wide supported fund, uh, this younger plan as it's called, is in place, um, may help us to draw down even more. Um, and that's, that may well be on top of other schemes, perhaps in the energy sector, uh, and indeed others, where we could draw down funds that would help the private sector to develop those infrastructure projects in Northern Ireland in order to enhance our economy. I call Leslie Cree. Deputy Speaker, um, the Minister will know that there are three basic elements in the plan. I'm just wondering, Minister, how the um, high-risk project funding would work in Northern Ireland, that particular aspect of it? There, we have got to be careful in, in uh, seeking investment from, from the plan. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we have been able to input into the UK-wide um, uh, pipeline of projects. Uh, and Debbie Speaker, I don't think it's, I don't think we should miss an opportunity to fly Northern Ireland's flag uh, in terms of particular projects that we have here that, that, that may be able to avail of, of, of funding. Uh, and some of them will be will be high risk. There obviously there are some projects which. We may instinctively think of a big infrastructure project around, around roads and so forth, which would not be maybe as suitable for this type of financing because it requires a, a private sector element to it. Uh, not, that doesn't mean that those types of projects are out. Um, it just may be a little bit more difficult to realise than some, particularly around the, the energy sector, where I think there's maybe a little bit more, because of the heavy involvement of the private sector and our energy infrastructure, maybe better opportunity there. However, some of those projects that I can think of are high risk, high risk in the sense that I think they're, they're good projects, but they're, they're very novel. Uh, they're perhaps uh, trailblazers in, in not even in a UK sense, but also across Europe. So there's perhaps a degree of risk. I think what, what is being taken forward here by the European Union is precisely that, uh, uh, as a member has identified, this is one of the, these are some of the types of projects that they want to back, those that are perhaps a little bit risky uh, and that the market therefore isn't, isn't fully behind or would find it difficult to back, that this money, this, this cheaper financing coming from the EU would, would take away some of that risk and make those, those propositions a lot more easier to bank or finance uh, from conventional sources for whatever is left over. So I actually think it may, it may help um, with those higher risk projects. Um, and I think whenever you've got the opportunity to at least um, find out from Europe whether they can avail of them or not and therefore enhance our, our infrastructure, we should be taking those opportunities. I call Sammy Douglas. Question number five, please. Mr. Deputy Speaker, all contracts that are based on central procurement directorates, standard forms of contract, will contain social clauses that relate to equality and health and safety. Departments can also include additional social clauses intended to deliver their departmental responsibilities and policy priorities and support the Programme for Government commitment. The first year of reporting on the Programme for Government commitment was 2012-13. Reports provided by departments show that for financial years 2012-13 and 
1,914 contracts included additional social clauses. However, not all departments provided a report. It is disappointing that reporting is therefore incomplete. CPD will ask departments to provide figures for 14-15 in April of this year. And that ends our period for list of questions, and we now move on to topical questions. And I call Katrina Ruan. Thank you, Mr. Principal, or Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, and I wonder, could the Minister uh, outline his department's proposals for revenue generation, given the constraints on the local budget? Uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, again, an error of unreality. Um, the uh, House will know. Uh, that tomorrow uh, we're bringing forward our, uh, regional, our regional rate order, uh, which is the largest source of local revenue that this executive uh, relies on. That's about 5% of our, of our total budget, raises over a billion pounds uh, a year, which goes obviously to ourselves and central government, also goes down to local government as well. I'm very pleased that the executive has agreed um, to uh, freeze in real terms again for, I think, the eighth consecutive year, uh, the regional rate. Uh, which ensures that Northern Ireland continues to have the lowest level of household taxes in all of the UK. The House Office had a debate around uh, revenue raising um, just uh, a fortnight ago. Uh, and one of the things that I found enlightening about that debate was that no one was prepared to enlighten me about areas in which they would support uh, the raising of substantial revenue. There were some proposals came forward, but to be perfectly frank and honest, Mr. Deputy Speaker, uh, many of them were messing around the edges and wouldn't have had a significant impact on our budget. I thank the Minister for his answer, but maybe he'd widen his horizon and maybe re-examine re, uh, re the debate, because I think it would be interesting for us to know, have you any proposals for ensuring we can maximise the potential for the European Investment Bank to drive local infrastructure development? Mr. The first question, and, and indeed the second question, was about, um, or I thought was it started off anyway, and the second question was about, about raising revenue. Um, going to the European Investment Bank for, for uh, support is not revenue raising. Uh, in fact, anything we raise from them would have to be repaid yeah. by the executive. But I have gone, obviously, and I, I'm, I'm surprised that not for the first time perhaps Sinn Féin are, are slow learners, um, but I went to the European Investment Bank about a year ago, about 12 months ago. Uh, and started a conversation with them. It has ultimately led to the agreement by the executive to create an investment fund for Northern Ireland and the objective of that fund, which I referenced in response to Mr Irwin uh, a few moments ago, is to pump prime that with uh, roughly 100 million of our, of our own uh, financing, but to draw down close to 1 billion pounds from the European Investment Bank and to do so in that way and support a range of infrastructure projects in social housing and urban regeneration, energy efficiency uh, and energy production uh, will ensure that we get around the very, very strict Treasury rules that are there about borrowing for conventional capital projects like roads and hospital expansions. Very, very happy to do that, Deputy Speaker. We'll continue to do that. We'll avail of any opportunity that there is to bring in finance that is suitable for Northern Ireland. Um, but I would encourage the member, and indeed all sides of the House, that whenever we talk about revenue raising in the traditional sense, let's not forget that someone has to pay. Uh, and there are people outside there in Northern Ireland, whether it's in businesses, or whether it's in the, the, uh, the community and households, they are still suffering, still finding it hard to make ends meet. And I'm very, very proud, Deputy Speaker, of the fact that even in those very difficult years over the last number of years, even in, in the face of a very difficult budget, that we have man maintained our record as having the lowest household yeah. bills in the whole of the United Kingdom. Yeah. I call Michelle McElveen. Mr Deputy Speaker, could I ask the Minister what plans are in place to deal with the public sector strike planned for Friday? Mr. Deputy Speaker, it is, it's difficult to estimate at this stage uh, of the week what the complete impact uh, of the, the strike will be. And obviously, uh, as the House would, would expect, Deputy Speaker will continue to, to monitor over the next number of days what the likely impact on, on, on public services, uh, particularly key public services, will be as a result of the strike uh, that is proposed for Friday. Um, and whilst I can't predict what the actual impact will be, the one thing that I can predict with a degree of confidence, Deputy Speaker, is that services will suffer uh, and it will be the public who will feel the ill effects of uh, a strike in our public sector. Uh, and that will be felt in, in hospitals uh, with uh, delayed or cancelled appointments or surgery. It will be, could well be uh, felt in schools if schools are having to close as a result of it. And sometimes we forget, too, that there will be a knock-on impact to 
the private sector as a result of strike action, particularly around school closures. So parents who perhaps are working part-time and, are, and, and put their, are reliant on putting their kids into the school in the morning may have to take the day off, and there will be revenue and income lost to those households who rely on that work, who rely on their schools to be there and open every day of the week. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, we're not entirely sure what the impact will be, but one thing I'm absolutely certain about is that it, the people who will suffer in Northern Ireland will be the people who are using public services and who rely on our public services every single day. I call Michelle McElveen for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, and further to that, could I ask the Minister for his view on the strike action and whether he considers it to be counterproductive? I, I do think, I think it's in many respects, I think it's a counterproductive. Uh, and, and not only do I not think that strike action is actually justified, it would appear uh, if the ballot for NIPSA, the largest uh, public sector union in Northern Ireland, is anything to go by, where the vote was 52% in favour of strike, 47% against strike action that not everybody within the trade union movement, not all of the trade union members are themselves convinced of the need to go on strike. It's not a hugely convincing win for strike action, and particularly whenever you're considered that it was only voted for by around 10% of all of NIPS's members. And like, I, I, can, I can understand the concern that is there in trade unions, just as it is across society at large, about we are, we are facing into a very difficult budget situation next year. Uh, but whenever I hear, as I do frequently on the radio uh, and television, unions talking about job losses within the public sector, let's bear in mind, as I said in response to questions earlier, no one is being forced to leave the public sector in Northern Ireland. The voluntary exit scheme is exactly that, is a voluntary exit scheme. And Mr Deputy Speaker, I can inform the House that as of midday today, 3,774 expressions of interest have been made for the voluntary exit scheme, and that's just within the Northern Ireland Civil Service. That's roughly 15% of the civil service have expressed an initial interest in the scheme. Many of those people are NIPSA members, and they are volunteering to come forward to see whether they might want to leave the public sector. This is not something, Deputy Speaker, that is being forced on anybody. If there is protesting, if there is disagreement, if there is anger to be put in any direction, it should be put in the direction of 10 Downing Street, where the budget for Northern Ireland, 95% of the budget for Northern Ireland comes from, and we have to make the best of what we have. I think we have a good budget. I think it is a budget that is focused on key public services. It is a budget that is focused on economic growth. And if the unions have anger and they want to direct it somewhere, direct it where it should go. Moving on, I call Mike Nesbitt. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. The Minister has already made reference to the impact on the 2015-16 budget of today's failure uh, to progress the Welfare Reform Bill. Can I ask the Minister, is there any implication for the current 14-15 budget? Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously, given what has happened today um, and the, the welching on the agreement that all the five executive parties, including the party that the member uh, leads, uh, agreed to before Christmas and have been implementing post-Christmas. Uh, there are a lot of implications that flow from it, not least budgetary implications and financial um, consequences. Uh, I will be studying that very, very carefully in the remainder of, of, of today and, and probably into tomorrow as well. And we'll want to, as I said in response to Mr. Allister earlier, uh, want to take that up with, with Treasury counterparts. Um, I don't foresee any implications for this financial year. Um, but I can certainly see consequences for the next financial year and indeed financial years beyond that. for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I thank the, uh, the Minister. He'll be aware of the letter from the Chancellor of the Exchequer to uh, the First Minister dated the 9th of October 2014, uh, when uh, the Chancellor notes that the Executive will be unable to live within its 14-15 budgets without an extraordinary loan of £100 million and the number of bullet points uh, which represent uh, the conditions uh, attached to that £100 million, surely that does have uh, implications given today's decision on welfare reform. Yeah, there, there, there is there's certainly, I mean, it's one of those factors that's in my head in terms of uh, an area where there is definitely going to be a consequence. Um, there could be a consequence in terms of the withdrawal of the, that available funding, which would, would have serious implications for uh, the executive's uh, block grant and whether we live within our block grant or not. Um, I don't suspect, um, I'm guessing at this stage that, that that would happen, but irrespective of whether it did or not, there is an implication in terms of how we repay it next year, because as the member in the House will recall, flexibility has been given to the executive in terms of how we repay that loan and where we repay that loan from. 
uh, and that was a part of the agreement that was reached at Stormont House. And obviously, if we, the Stormont House agreement is out the window, then so is that flexibility, and it does have very serious implications for our budget, if not for this year, but certainly for next year, and absolutely definitely for years beyond that too. The members listed for topical questions four and five have had their names withdrawn. I call Tom Elliott. Thank you, Deputy Speaker, and I'm wondering if the, if the Minister can provide us uh, with an update of the equal pay settlement or, or requirements that was asked for by those who were transferred mainly to the PSNI staff, court service and NIO who didn't get the, the civil service equal pay. Uh, sir, um, Deputy Speaker, I think I, I responded um, uh, in this question to, or in this particular issue to Mr Elliott's colleague Mr Hussey at the last question time a few, few weeks ago. Uh, and the situation hasn't changed since then. And just for, for the members' benefit, I reiterate the, the point that I made to Mr. Hussey back then. Um, as he will be aware, and the House will be aware, there is no equal um, pay issue here. That has been settled by the court in the judgment that was made um, over a, roughly a couple of years ago. That there is no equal pay issue in this case. But myself and others uh, were obviously convinced of the uh, moral case that was there. Uh, for these staff who had, were not able to avail of the Northern Ireland Civil Service equal pay scheme. Uh, I developed with officials a, a scheme which I thought capable of resolving the issue, if not, not to everybody's satisfaction, I'm sure, but it would have gone some way to resolving the issue and addressing the, the moral argument that had been put forward. That paper has been with the executive now since roughly this time last year. It has not been taken, it has not been tabled because Sinn Féin have not agreed to table that paper. I believe, Deputy Speaker, that I have done everything I can in terms of producing a solution. I think it's a, a viable solution. I'm sure if I was to reveal it to the House, people would say, what about this and what about that? But it is, I think, the best stab at, the, at a solution that is available in the circumstances. I had hoped that um, the changes um, that had been agreed in terms of process for uh, the executive, in terms of bringing business onto the executive agenda, agreed at Stormont House would allow this issue to be brought forward to the executive in a not too distant future and allow those who, um, who had supported, I thought, the claims that were being made by the members of staff the member talks about to put their money where their mouth is and actually back the solution that I had put forward. But given today's events, I'm not even sure where, where those procedures will now be. Call Tom Elliott for supplementary. Uh, thank the Minister for that update. And, um, he did say that it has been with the executive, or, or I am assuming ministerial colleagues, he means for, for a year now. Uh, and he, he did hint that maybe within the Stormont House proposals that there was a mechanism to get it to the executive. Is there no mechanism under the current executive uh, to actually bring it where you as a minister can bring it uh, to the table of the executive without uh, the agreement of other ministers? There's, there's a convention that allows me to I can bring it for discussion, but not for, for agreement. Um, so, you know, you could do that, you can have a discussion, but it's not, not going to go anywhere. What I had hoped is that the uh, agreement reached at, at Stormont House would allow us to put that item on the, the agenda for a decision. Um, and, and I will still proceed on that basis in the, in the next number of weeks uh, if we are able to do that or, uh, still. And, and, and I hope that what I had hoped by doing that was that um, the solution would be put on the table. Um, and that members could vote, vote it up or down. And I think it is, as I say, it's, far, it's probably far from perfect in the eyes of those who it is targeted at, but it is at least a solution. And I know from talking to, to many members of PSNI and former NIO staff that they just want some form of resolution to this issue that has gone on for, for so long. Um, I've done all that I can, and I hope um, that even in spite of everything else, that in the next number of weeks we may be able to at least table the paper and see where people actually really stand on it whenever, whenever the cookie crumbles. I call Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, if I could ask the Minister, I, recently I met with young directors in my capacity as a member of the Northern Ireland Assembly Business Trust. One of the issues they raised was the uh, high rate, high business rate in comparison to the rents that they were paying uh, for their uh, business premises. I was wondering if the minister would have any comment to make in relation to that. Uh, these, of course, were small businesses. Well, two, two points in the limited time that I have available to me. One is the, uh, the extension of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, targeted specifically at, at small business properties in Northern Ireland, um, which has given 
uh, gives £20 million worth of support to small businesses uh, across Northern Ireland that has been extended for a, a further year, from 15 16. Uh, the revaluation of non domestic properties was exactly about uh, trying to better ad adapt and change and distribute more fairly the rates burden, which itself hasn't increased, but across businesses in respect of and, and, and using analysis of uh, more current rents than previous rates were assessed on. So I would hope. And it will not be the case in every instance, but I would hope that many of those who were bending the member's ear uh, last week uh, will see whenever the new rates bills are, are um, issued in the next number of, of days, actually, that um, they will have seen an improvement, not just because of the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme, but also because the revaluation is more accurately reflected uh, the rates liability and the rates valuation compared to where their, their rental is. And that is the end of the period allocated for question time.